Okay. All right. Um, we're going to be talking today about cardiovascular ultrasound, specifically the left ventricular function. I know I went to you guys last year and we described some of this where you could see the contractility and I was talking about the mitral valve coming up and smacking the septum. Remember that? Does that ring a bell? That's probably the only thing you remember. That's cool. Uh, no problem there. But we're going to talk, we're going to review that. We're going to talk about color flow Doppler um, across the mitral valve in both the parasternal long and an apical four chamber. And we're going to learn how to measure the left ventricular outflow tract diameter, combine that value with um, the velocity time integral of flow across the aortic valve, and that will give us cardiac output. So we're going to talk about hemodynamics. And then um, we're going to talk about how the carotid intimal medial thickness um, is a surrogate marker for um, multivessel coronary uh, artery and um, artery disease and also for strokes. And then finally, we're going to go over lower extremity venous compression ultrasound to rule out uh, blood clots in the legs. So recall that uh, last year when I came to you, we talked about the different um, locations to, to point the probe. And the one way is here against the parasternal long axis. This is where, the, as its name suggests, parasternal, para means next to sternum. You place it right along the edge of the sternum and you aim the indicator down towards the patient's left, somewhere between their, if their arm was at their side, it'd be their left elbow or their left hip in this kind of direction this way. And then the apical four chamber view where we place the probe right on top of the uh, point of maximal impulse or uh, PMI and then we shoot the sound right down through the apex uh, into the heart with the indicator towards the patient's right. We're not going to be talking about the subxiphoid view in this talk. Um, we will in the future but not for this specific talk. Now in the parasternal long axis you're going to place the probe along its long longest axis. Okay. Notice I'm not saying show me a sagittal view of the heart or a transverse view of the heart. I don't say that because the heart runs in uh, an oblique plane. It runs in a, a, long, a sort of a cattywampus plane across the body. So that's why we, we describe it in terms of its axis rather than its plane. We say parasternal long axis or we'll say parasternal short axis sometimes if we turn it the other way. But it looks like this. We have the indicator down towards the patient's left elbow if their arm is at their side. That's probably the best way to describe it. And what you see when you do that is uh, very superficially here very anteriorly, we see the right ventricle, okay? So the right ventricle, it's amazing how close it is to the skin line and how that's a little chink in our armor as human beings where if we had somebody stab us there or maybe it was a stingray that we're swimming with could get us there in, the, um, in that sort of parasternal fourth, fifth intercostal space, that's where you put the probe in order to see the heart because it comes so close to the chest wall. Um, in this view, in this long axis, with a three-chambered view, we see the right ventricle up here anteriorly. Then we see the left ventricle uh, down here, and the left atrium is over here. So the blood's coming from this left atrium. It's going through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. As the left ventricle squeezes, it goes out the left ventricular outflow tract and then to the uh, aorta and then um, to the rest of the body. Now, it looks a little something like this during systole and diastole. Here it is, here it is again, the left atrium, our left ventricle, and then our aortic outflow tract. And you can make out this mitral valve. It's a bicuspid valve. We see the anterior leaflet right here. We can see as it makes its way up towards the interventricular septum, which is right here. And ideally, you should see that anterior septal leaflet of the mitral valve come up and smack that interventricular septum. And here's that posterior leaflet down here. So during diastole, when the heart is sucking the blood out of that left atrium into the left ventricle as it expands out like that, a good contracting left ventricle, a good functioning left ventricle, will get that mitral valve to open up nice and wide. And that's why that's one of the normal findings we see. The other thing we look for in normal contractility is this interventricular septum right here. We like to see that come towards that posterior wall and vice versa. We like to see these two things squeeze together and that's another sign that there's good contractility. And then finally, this is the left ventricular outflow, outflow tract here. I'm going to go ahead and pause it right there. And this is end systole. We can see that the heart is all nice and contracted down with the septum towards that posterior wall. End systole, these valve leaflets fly open. And this distance right here is called LVOT, or left ventricular outflow tract. And that becomes a critical measurement when we want to measure the cardiac output. And this is what it looks like in all its glory, a, a, a nice, a normal looking parasternal long axis. 
And I say normal because when I look at this, I'm looking for um, really uh, two main things. I'm looking for that this mitral valve comes up and smacks that septum, and then number two, that this posterior wall and this interventricular septum make their way towards each other. And indeed, they are doing that in this view. And so what I do clinically is if I have a patient who's got hypotension, okay, I am trying to resuscitate them, and I break hypotensive patients down into, you know, do I give them fluids? So if a, if a person comes in my ER, if their blood pressure is 70 over 40, how do I get their blood pressure back up? I can give them fluids. That's kind of my knee-jerk response. And if I saw a normal functioning left ventricle like this, yeah, I could safely give this person fluids. Uh, and that would probably fix their hypotension. But instead, if I saw a weakly functioning left ventricle, if I gave that person fluids, well, then I could be in trouble because that fluid, if that heart is too weakly functioning, it can't handle that fluid that I'm giving it, and the fluid starts to back up in the lungs, and the patient can go into pulmonary edema with congestive heart failure, and that's what that means. And so, in those patients, you've got to be very gingerly with the fluids, and you want to give them another type of medication to help their heart contract better, an inotropic medication. One example is dobutamine. Now, this is just a sort of schematic diagram uh, laid, uh, laid over the uh, personal long axis to show you kind of where the chambers are, where the leaflets are, and, uh, and sort of the idea there. Now, we're going to look at these next few hearts, and I want you to tell me, do I give this patient fluids or inotropic medicine when I see this heart? Right off the bat, you guessed it, inotropic medicine. How do I know that? Well, I'm going to first look over there at that, uh, at that mitral valve. Is it smacking the septum? Nope. And then I'm going to come over here to that posterior wall and the interventricular septum. Are those two things coming together? Nope. So this person, if I gave them fluids, it could back up in their lungs. and have to be very careful here. Because, you know, when the nurse comes to you and says, hey, this patient's hypotensive, we've got to resuscitate this guy, how much fluid should I give him? That's their first question to you. So you just got to be very careful there that uh, you don't just start dumping fluids into a heart that looks like this. That's why anybody's hypotensive, I immediately go to the bedside and I take a look at their heart, and then I make a decision about, what to, about whether or not to give fluids at that point. What do you think about this, this heart right here? First question that comes to my mind, I look at this heart, I look down at the patient, and I'm like, are they dead. Does this patient have a pulse? Because this heart is really not looking good, right? So first of all, we got that mitral valve. I mean, the mitral valve is just sort of camping out right here, not doing hardly anything at all. Um, certainly, it's just almost just kind of fluttering along there, not, not really making any uh, decent headway at all towards, this, towards the septum. And then we look, this is, the, this is the chamber size of the left ventricle here, and we see that interventricular septum, we see that posterior wall, not really squeezing together very much. In fact, not really moving at all. Here's another thing I'm noticing. The right ventricle is up here. It's actually larger than the left ventricle. And in certain settings, this is a, this is a problem because when we see somebody with a large right ventricle, normally the right ventricle is only two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. When someone gets a right ventricle that gets as big or even bigger like this case than the left ventricle, that's a sign of right ventricular strain. What would cause that? The right ventricle is trying to pump blood to what organ? The lungs, right? So the blood's trying to get out to the lungs. If the right ventricle is straining so hard to push that blood out to the lungs because something in the lungs is not letting it get there, like a blood clot, pulmonary embolism, if the blood can't get out there, the right ventricle just starts to get bigger and bigger. We call that RV strain. And RV strain, one of the first life-threatening causes that comes to mind, is something I can treat with thrombolytic therapy in the setting of, sh of hypotension, in the setting of shock, thrombolytics are indicated. And on this patient right here, we did give them thrombolytic therapy, and they actually did have a blood clot in their lung, and they survived. Another thing that can cause RV strain is pulmonary hypertension. The blood's not getting to the lungs as well as it should uh, because of some narrowing there or some increased pressures in the pulmonary system, and it causes the blood to back up in that right heart, and you get RV strain. Do you have a question? So that's a good question. So how do we know that this is really, I mean, we're, we're, we've got this long axis through the heart. If I, if I fan the sound from one side to the other side through this cylinder, cylinder-ish, cone-ish thing, um, and maybe I'm just shortening uh, my, my axis, my view of it, right? Well, um, if I can see the mitral valve on the screen, 
I'm pretty much at the midpoint of this person's heart. So I see the mitral valve on the screen. It's a good question. I'm not off to one side or the other. I'm straight dead down the exact, you know, sagittal axis, not to use the word sagittal, long axis, sorry, of this, of this heart. So this patient's got very poor, had very poor um, LV function, but certainly with, um, when we were able to give this patient some thrombolytics, that cleared up that blood clot, blood got back to the lungs, and this patient actually had a pretty decent outcome. What about this one here? Fluids or inotropic therapy? If their blood pressure was 70, I'm looking at that mitral valve, I'm saying, yep, coming up and smacking that septum right there. See that? Right there, actually, yeah. And you could do that in your machine. You know, you can freeze the machine, and you can back it up or go forward with it. You're going to do that today quite a bit. So there's that mitral valve smacking that septum. Now we come over and look at that interventricular septum and its movement towards that left ventricle. Let's call this right here end systole. How do I know that is end systole? Well, the posterior wall and the interventricular septum are close to each other right there. And this aortic outflow tract, that's open. This is, this is the one leaflet of this aortic valve. It's a tricuspid valve. We don't see all the leaflets here. There's one leaflet. We can see it's clearly open. And I'm sort of hallucinating a little bit. Maybe that posterior leaflet down here is also open. And the blood's coming out during systole. And this is that LVOT that you're going to measure as uh, one measurement when, you, when we go move to the hemodynamics part of things. So this person's actually got pretty good contractility there. And I would say this person, if they were hypotensive, I would uh, open up the fluids on this patient to resuscitate them because of the normal RV function. And by the way, I kind of paused it at the end of systole and the end of diastole. The end of diastole is right here, somewhere around here, OK? See how the chamber size is the largest there? So one thing you can do, if you want to take the time to do it, you can actually measure the left ventricle at the end of diastole. And, and you can drop some calipers that we call discs through there. There's several ways to do it. But you can imagine you could trace the area of the left ventricle cone at the end of diastole, do the same thing at the end of systole, and the machine will calculate the ejection fraction as an actual number. The only downside to that is that um, because we look at these hearts in two dimensions, um, they don't always have the most accurate numbers, and it takes time to do that. It takes you know some really futzing around with the machine and dropping calipers and getting all those numbers on there and cranking out the software. Personally, I just look at that heart and decide from a qualitative perspective if I'm going to go with fluids or inotropic therapy. And that's what I want you guys to remember. Quantitatively, I think the cardiac output stuff we're about to do, very useful. Ejection fractions, I don't know. I, I just like to look at these hearts and decide what I'm going to do next. How about this one here? Medications or fluids? Medications, exactly right. See that mitral valve there? Not really doing much towards the septum. And we come back there, we look at that septum and that posterior wall, not doing a lot for me either. Not a lot of delta in that chamber size between end systole and end diastole. You guys think about this. Medications or fluids? Medications, very good. Excellent. Any questions before I leave kinesis and move on to Doppler color? Okay. Now, this is a slide that you saw uh, last week, and um, hopefully you remember it. This is where we're talking about in the physics lecture that when you work with color flow Doppler, red is flow towards the transducer, and blue is flow away from the transducer. Okay? Um, this is just demonstrating an aortic. Uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm and some sort of turbulent flow rolling all around in there. So it's just to show you the red and the blue. But really, it's the scale that I want you to pay attention to. Red is flow towards the probe. Blue is flow away from the probe. Yes? Can you just get this in my head? Uh, the, the, the top of the screen would be the transducer? Correct. Exactly right. This is the skin line of the transducer, the footprint of the transducer right there. And the way we activate this flow, we come down here after we hit mode. Here's the different modes. Well, there's 2D, which is just straight up brightness mode. There's color, which is what we're seeing here. So you're going to activate that color, and then you're going to see the um, 
this gate, this color box pop up on the screen, and you're going to place that over the valve. Now, before we do that, I just want to give you a quick little video reminder about what mitral valve regurgitation is. A healthy is. mitral valve keeps your blood moving in the right direction. A leaky valve doesn't close the way it should, allowing some blood to flow backwards. Your heart becomes less efficient, and if left untreated, a leaky valve could lead to heart failure. So we see this, um, this is the parasitic long axis, and we see this color box placed, uh, or sampling box placed over the mitral valve. And here, the mitral valve is actually closed, and um, red, there's a red jet squirting backwards oh, um, in this direction, which tells us that there's a, some mitral valve regurgitation going on here. Now, one of the problems with measuring color flow across the mitral valve in the parasternal long axis is that this is not the best spot to do it. It's better to do it in the apical four chamber, which I'll get to in a minute. The reason the parasternal long is not the best place to do this is because the mitral valve is really perpendicular at this location to the, the transducer. And remember from the physics thing last week that cosine of theta is in the numerator of the Doppler equation. And so whenever the red blood cells are coming along, when they get right underneath the probe or 90 degrees to the probe, you get cosine of 90 in the numerator. That's zero in the numerator, and you get loss of the Doppler signal. You're going to hear me come back to that over and over again. But that's why you could drop the gate there, and they do it right here, and it shows some flow going the wrong direction across that valve. But what they've done is they've actually steered that gate just slightly off 90 degrees. And that's a little bit of a fancy adjustment you could do on the machine, but we're going to learn that throughout this year. Now we're going to switch to the apical four chamber view. This is probably the hardest view of the heart to get, the most challenging, requires a lot of patient positioning. It's particularly difficult in women with uh, large breasts because you got to move the breast out of the way to get to this little view here. So um, this is the one you're going to struggle, struggle with to obtain, but it's the one that gives you the most bang for your buck. So. You're going to place that transducer just uh, inferior to where sort of the nipple line is and lateral in that area down there by the nipple. And you're going to have the indicator of the patient's right. And basically, because you're placing the transducer right on the patient's PMI, remember during physical exam skills, you'd roll the patient left lateral decubitus, stick up. You could wedge a pillow under the right shoulder. That brings the heart to the chest wall. That's exactly what you're going to do here every time you do an apical four chamber view. Okay, you're going to roll the patient left lateral decubitus, stick a pillow under the right shoulder, and then you're going to put the probe right on their PMI. Okay, and what you're going to see when you do that is at the very top of the screen, the skin line with the probe's footprints on the skin line, you're going to see the apex. And then the sound is shooting straight down the barrel of the gun that is the heart. Okay, and you'll, it's a great way to see that the RV is about two-thirds the size of the LV. It's a nice way to kind of gauge chamber size, the overall function of the heart, the atria, the valves. It's a cool view. And this is a schematic of that apical four chamber view. And just think about our pro being right up here, and that sector of sound is coming out like this, apex of the heart being here. And if we, put some, if we were to put color here, here's the left atrium. Here's the left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. Remember the indicator is to the patient's right, which makes this the right side of the heart. Left atrium, the blood is flowing from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And if we were to put that color flow signal along here, well, red would be flowing towards the probe and blue would be flowing away from the probe. That's the idea. So keep that in mind as we go th um, through this stuff. By the way, the aortic valve is like snudged right up in here. We're going to get to that in a minute, but that's where the aortic valve is. So once it's coming out of this, during systole, it's being pumped out of this LV, assuming there's not much mitral valve regurgitation. In other words, the blood is not going this way, but it's going right down into this little area that's off out of the plane of view. It's a little bit more anterior out of the plane of view, and that's where the aortic valve is. Quick view, you want to have the indicator here towards the patient's right again. You're sort of right underneath that left nipple aiming towards the spine and that will get that view there will get you the heart on the screen to stand straight up with the septum standing top to bottom that's the septum there it's the left ventricle right so this is what it looks like when you 
this is sort of an average view here. I wouldn't say it's extra pretty. I would say it's not too ugly or fuzzy. It's probably about the average view that you see. Because remember, there's so much lung around all this stuff that uh, the lung the air is the enemy of ultrasound. You get some scatter there. So that's why some, sometimes they don't look that crisp. And the larger that the lung fields these patients have, so the patients who have COPD or expanded lung fields, you're going to struggle extra hard trying to get these views. Okay. In the models upstairs, I'd say pretty much all of them have pretty decent apical four chambers. Last Tuesday, we had one person really struggle to get her apical four, uh, but everybody else upstairs today seems to be pretty decent at that. Notice once in a while we see that aortic valve pop in there. See that little spot? I mean, we're going to come back to that. Let's go ahead and throw some um, color across that mitral valve. Now during systole, Red is flow away from the probe. Blue is flow, flow, I'm sorry, red is flow, BART. Blue away, red towards. I mix that up. That's one way to remember it, BART. Blue away, red towards. During systole, we don't expect to see blood being squirting away from the probe in, back into the left atrium. So this blue jet that we see here coming in the back that left, that left atrium and smacking into the, to the far wall of that left atrium, that's, um, that's a good amount of, um, this would be somewhere around moderate to severe aortic, uh, sorry, mitral valve regurgitation. Because we see how that during systole, we shouldn't see that blue jet slamming back into that left atrium. Make sense? All right. Now, keep coming back to this, but this is the aortic valve in here. And during systole, the blood really should be going here and not back through the mitral valve. Let's talk now more about this aortic valve. Actually, it's something called the apical five-chamber view, or A5C, the fifth chamber being that aortic valve. Recall that that aortic valve is a little bit more anterior, so what we need to do is, once we're in the apical four, we simply fan the probe a little bit more anteriorly and, you know, kind of tilt it up a little bit, and we should see that that aortic valve jumps in the middle of the screen. The tricuspid valve and the right atrium kind of go out of the imaging plane while the aorta maintains itself right there in the center of the screen. Sometimes it's hard to do in females when you're trying to keep them covered up, but uh, you need to go one intercostal space higher or more superior and slightly more lateral to get better alignment with that ultrasound beam. This is all stuff in hands-on that you're going to pick up over time practicing with this. Um, I just wanted to briefly describe it before we get to hands-on. This is a still image of that aortic valve. This is the aortic fifth chamber, if you will, apical fifth chamber. Here's the LV. Here's the RV. We see the apical fifth chamber there. This is the RA, kind of out of the plane. We don't even see the tricuspid valve anymore because we're so anterior. This is the LA with its mitral valve. We can still make that out. This is what it looks like um, when we have it really nice. Apical fifth chamber. There's the aortic valve right there. See that? Where my arrow is, I'll get it out of the way. And over here, BART, blue away, red towards, okay? We've got the transducer up here along that apex. And during systole, we expect to see blue away right into the aortic valve. That's what we're expecting to see. That's normal because the blood's going through that aortic valve. If we get a red towards, well, then the blood is regurgitating back across that aortic valve and back into the left ventricle. So that's why there's a little aortic regurgitation coming out of the aortic valve it's just right here. That's what that red is, red towards. So this person has some aortic regurgitation. Now that left ventricular outflow tract seen in that apical five chamber view, this is just a schematic of it. This is where you're going to be dropping that Doppler gate right through here. And somewhere along that gate, you'll see that little TIE fighter looking thing. That's going to be right just somewhere right on the edge of this aortic valve, just um, right along here. That's where we're going to be dropping that uh, Doppler little TIE fighter, in this general vicinity in here. And that will set us up to measure the cardiac output. Let me show what I mean. So to measure the cardiac output, the first thing you do is you measure the diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract. And you can see that in the parasternal long axis. So First thing you do is you go back to parasternal long. Remember that? That's the RV up here, the LV over here, the LA is here, mitral valve is right here, and then the blood comes in this L, 
LV and it gets pumped out this aortic outflow tract. And actually right now, I could tell that this, this aortic valve, when they come together, they have that little white line at the tip of my arrow. You can see that little white line. That's the, that's the leaflets that came together. And so that's um, during diastole, the heart's filling, those leaflets are together. Now, um, this is just a frozen and zoomed in version of that exact same valve, the leaflets are together. So in that frozen state, you can then take the dial, bottom left hand button, and you can rotate that dial counterclockwise and you'll back up to where end systole was. And those valve leaflets, will, you'll watch them just kind of march right open. And once they're open at their maximal point, you can put this, you can take a measurement here using the calculations functions between those two leaflets, and that's your LVOT diameter, your left ventricular outflow tract diameter. And that's going to be an important part of this whole cardiac output. So what the machine does is you lock in that value to the machine, the machine immediately squares that value, times it by pi, divide it by 4, to give you the LVOT area. So it takes the diameter, converts it into the area, and then the next thing you're going to do is measure the velocity time integral across that aortic valve. What does that mean? Here's what this means. You take the, that pulse wave Doppler, that TIE fighter thing, and you drop it right across that aortic valve right here in the apical fifth chamber. And then you activate the actual waveform, and this is what it gives you here. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is velocity, and so this little envelope right over here, this is the velocity time integral tells you that value, the velocity time integral of this envelope in combination with the LVOT area will give you, times heart rate will give you cardiac output. In the old days, we had to take this little green thing right here. We actually had to freeze the screen and then actually trace this out by hand. Okay? That's what we used to do. Well, nowadays, as of two months ago, the machine does it automatically. So that's really, it's actually why I'm teaching it to you because it's so convenient now to do this. It's just one huge less step to deal with. So to, to summarize, we got the LVOT diameter, we measured that ourselves, we gave that to the machine. And then the machine squared that times by pi divided by 4, and then it takes that and multiplies it by this term right here, the LVOT velocity time integral, that value, and that gives us stroke volume. And by the way, on the screen, since it's watching this, the, the pulsations of the heart, it knows what the heart rate is. So it takes that stroke volume, multiplies it by the heart rate that it's watching, and gives you cardiac output at the bottom of the screen. And it looks a little something like this. I think your probe's moving a little bit. That's the idea. So you measure that diameter first. <laughs> So that's Eric Mervis. He's uh, he's one of our residents in the emergency department, and um, he's um, when I first saw him do this, I thought, wow, does he just have really wide space nipples? Because look how far apart the probe is from his nipple. Um, but he doesn't. I looked for a web neck and other signs of uh, chromosomal abnormality. He doesn't. <laughs> he just all he has here is um, it's because he's standing up, and the heart shifted in his chest cavity a little more medially. This is why when we do this on the patients. We lay them flat and we roll them left lateral decubitus, and that makes the PMI somewhere over here. That's where you'd be put in the probe. But I just wanted to to, to, uh, to point this out. So, and he's a really good sport about stuff like that. So I'm sure he wouldn't mind that I stuck that up there. Any questions about that uh, about that kind of stuff? Yes. So you, you have parabolic flow coming out. So when you do the gating, how do you how large can you take the gate depending on where you are? You're going to yeah, so there's a sampling gate that you can make wider or skinnier, okay? And that's a good question. I've been messing with that sampling gate. What he's asking about, that little TIE fighter, you can spread out its wings, if you will, further apart or more, or more narrow, depending where, um, and that changes your waveform quite a bit. Um, so that's something we've got to mess around with. I'm not sure. This is all brand new stuff, so I'm not, I don't know the exact answer to your question. 
anything else about hemodynamics before we move on to a completely different topic? Cool. Carotid arteries are a, the, the wall of the carotid artery, the intimal medial thickness of the carotid is a surrogate marker for all of the vasculature in the body. What do I mean by that? A surrogate marker, we use these things in medicine all the time. Like when someone's having chest pain, they're having a heart attack in my ER, I check their blood for the surrogate marker of troponin because that spills out of the heart when they're having cardiac ischemia and I can check that as a, as a surrogate marker rather than having to immediately do, you know, percutaneous coronary angio, angiography right there at the bedside, I can use a non-invasive test, a relatively non-invasive test, like a blood test, to check for a heart attack. Surrogate markers usually have a lot of, you know, they're, they're not perfect, they're not the gold, they're not like pathology looking straight at the, at the disease itself, but they are convenient non-invasive ways of checking for stuff going on in our patients. Same thing with this carotid artery intimal medial thickness, or CIMT. Basically, you have, um, during atherogenesis, the intima and the media are both involved uh, in the anatomical progression of these lesions. The intimal thickness itself um, gets, you get fibromuscular hyperplasia there during aging, naturally, but the medial thickness, you get some smooth muscle hypertrophy there, um, actually when you have long-standing hypertension. Um, and then there's a plaque. You can always have a plaque between these layers, and that's what's causing the narrowing and everything. So, um, but so just age itself and hypertension can also uh, be an indicator here of intimal medial thickness going on. So the idea is if we can identify it before it becomes, you know, really thick, then uh, we can gauge the person for certain types of medication, antilipid antihypertensive therapy, stuff like that. We can put them in a risk category. And so that's what this trial did a few years ago. They took 7,200 women and 5,500 men aged 45 to 64 years who were free of coronary heart disease at baseline. And then they, they monitored their CIMTs, their carotid intimal medial thicknesses over 5.2 years and they used, as an endpoint, they used death or heart attacks. And uh, basically, if you had a CIMT greater than 1.0, whether you're male or female, you ended up in a very high risk category for having an event, a serious event. And so that's sort of a cutoff. 1.0 millimeters of intimal medial thickness puts your patient at a high risk for having not only a heart attack or sudden death, but also a stroke, as this other arm of the study showed. So we get to that magic number again, 1.0, and males, females both, high risk for strokes. And so that's what it means to be a surrogate marker, the CIMT. And primary care doctors can use this information. They can put it into a risk stratification um, pathway like this or algorithm, and they can decide if they're going to put them on a certain type of anti-lipid agent and a certain type of antihypertensive and watch these people over time. Now, historically, it's been difficult to get serial... CIMT measurements because these patients are just sort of, it's hard to logistically do that. Like they get lost to follow up, they don't keep their appointments. You got to get these people in to see a sonographer on a regular basis. Sonographers, you know, it's expensive, this kind of stuff. It ends up costing, it's just logistically hard to do. And so that's why CIMT, while it has some good data behind it, it hasn't really taken off the way people thought it would because logistically it's been difficult to do. But now that the machines are in your hands, Okay, the clinician's hands, the, if you're going to primary care, this is another great potential use here. You can use it to risk stratify your patients and help direct therapy there. So that's kind of the idea going on with this. How do you do it? Well, here's the carotid artery, okay? You've got the feet down here and you've got the head up here. And as the blood um, is flown up towards the brain, it gets to this bulb and then it bifurcates into the internal carotid and the external carotid. These areas are hard to visualize, especially with the longer footprint transducer, but this area down here, just distal to the bulb, very reliably seen in all individuals, regardless of the transducer. So some people have really short footprint transducers, others have like, we have the really long L38. Even with L38, actually with the L38, we get great views along the entire carotid and part of the, um, of the bulb. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna come down to this posterior wall, okay, or far wall, we call that the far wall. Why do we say that? 
This is near, this is skin line, and this is looking distally down here. This is far, and so we're going to use the far wall, okay? Because check it out. It turns out that when blood goes through, uh, I'm sorry, when sound goes through blood, blood is a low attenuating structure. Think back to the physics talk, right? Low attenuation, sound loves to travel through fluid. That's why we use the, the lumen of the carotid, if you will, as a window to better visualize structures posterior to it, specifically its posterior wall of the medial intimal layer of the carotid artery. That's why we measure on the far wall down here and not the near wall up here because we use the carotid blood as a nice echogenic window because it's low attenuating. And that's why everything back here looks so darn hyperechoic. Make sense? So this is the intimal layer. This is the medial layer down here. And that thickness that you see there, that's the intimal layer, intimal medial thickness that you're going to measure. And hopefully for your patient's sake, it's not more than, um, it's less than a millimeter. And we can see another example uh, down here. And this is how you place the probe. You place it here in the long axis like this down the patient's neck. CIMT, any questions before we change gears one final time? Just something to introduce you to. And uh, when we look today on the models, it's just a linear echo. You can't even see a separation because everybody's so young and healthy, okay? Um, but when you take this with you somewhere, this machine out to preceptorships or who knows where clinics, wards on older patients, you will start to see these thicknesses come off the screen. Question? Oh, so you, you, um, you, you basically measure it yourself. You're going to look, I, I just threw these, we threw these lines on here just so you could visualize it better, but you, you measure it. You're going to drop, you're going to zoom in on the structure here, and you're going to drop a caliper along that layer there. You just put one caliper there, one caliper down there. You just measure the, the, um, the, the thickness of it, the hypocoat part. Change of gears now to DVT. Now, if a patient comes in with leg swelling, um, I'm really worried that they could have a blood clot in their femoral or popliteal system causing that leg to swell out, okay? What puts patients at risk for blood clots? Well, it could be venous stasis. Like you take a long flight somewhere, you know, international flight, your legs are kind of hanging in one spot for a long time, the blood kind of congeals there and a clot can form, okay? Endothelial injury, like trauma, orthopedic surgery, these things put patients at incredibly high risks for having um, blood clots, okay? What else? What's Virchow's triad? What's the third part of the triad? So it's endothelial injury? Hypercoagulability. Hypercoagulability, that's the third one, very good. So people who have naturally hypercoagulable blood because of a, fact, like a factor deficiency, protein CRS deficiency, those patients are the ones where you hear the story, totally healthy person, you know, really active, triathlete, all of a sudden had a blood clot in their leg. Well, they have a, a protein CRS deficiency likely causing that. So what's the big deal? So what, you get a blood clot in your leg, why is it so scary? Because the blood clot can travel up the inferior vena cava, you know, into the uh, right heart and then out the pulmonary artery and then bam, hit the lung and can't go any further and now the blood can't get to the lung to oxygenate, the patient has a pulmonary embolism and they die. And so that's the danger here with, with this business. So the way you'd measure it is, um, the way you, the, you assess for it is you take that linear probe and you compress in that, uh, I'll show you where. So recall that the, um, the superficial and um, uh, deep femoral uh, arteries lie uh, laterally and the common femoral vein lies medially. There is a deep femoral vein, but it's of such small caliber that we don't really see it on ultrasound and therefore it's right down by the femur. It goes really deep, small caliber, not really a clinical um, relevant vessel. Occasionally there are, an there are anatomical variants. I've seen complete duplication of this entire system in several individuals now, just going about the country teaching this stuff. So it's sort of interesting, but most of the time you have the superficial deep femoral arteries and the common femoral vein. Um, and then it's that common femoral vein that you're going to compress from the area of the inguinal ligament where the great saphenous dumps in all the way down until you can't see it anymore, which is usually about where this adductor canal starts, about halfway down the leg. But then it comes out of that adductor canal and gets behind the knee into the popliteal fossa. And then you can start compressing it again. So 
when I look at this picture here, I see the superficial femoral artery, the deep femoral artery, those structures that are paired, and the common femoral vein. This is a very typical view, high up uh, proximally in the groin, right near where the saphenous vein dumps in. And um, so which leg am I looking at here? If the indicator is to the patient's right, can you tell which leg this is? Left leg. Very good. How do you know that? Well, he knows that venous vein rhymes with venous penis. And so that's why this is more medial, okay? Or you could say venous vagina if you want to. But the vein is more medial. The artery is more lateral. That's how I remember it. There was something, another way to remember it, but it, I couldn't remember that way. So you can, the other way is, you know, you can always cheat and look at which, where your probe is on the patient's body. But I took my fellow and I told him to draw, to, to map his his femoral vein as it went down his leg. And this is the, the track it takes. Right in here is where it's really hard to see. He kind of guessed, I think, where he put it. But then back here in the popliteal fossa, you can see it again. And in that popliteal fossa, what's happening is the popliteal vein comes down and then it bifurcates and it trifurcates. And it's so furcated down here that it's such a small <laughs> caliber down here in the calf that we don't really care about it too much anymore. Clinic, diagnostically speaking, those small caliber calf veins um, even if they do have a clot, we don't treat them anymore. So um, it does put them at risk for progression to a, to a more proximal uh, clot someday. So we, they do come back for repeat scans. But, um, uh, but it's, we're really concerned with this popliteal region. And so here's the popliteal vein. Here's the popliteal artery. The vein comes to the top and the pop. That's how you can remember that. And again, it's this sort of bifurcation that occurs. That's sort of the area that you're going to be looking at. Um, this is my right hand holding the transducer. The patient's leg is externally rotated. They're still kind of sitting up in the bed or lying supine either way, but you're going to externally rotate their leg. You're going to have their knee flex. And in that position, I can get good access to their popliteal fossa. I take my other hand, in this case my left hand, I put it on the patient's knee, and then I push these two things together. So I use my left hand to help kind of stabilize the pushing. Now, somebody who's of uh, normal uh, body habitus like this person, it's not that crucial of a, of a maneuver to use your left hand. But you can imagine when you have patients who are, have much larger legs um, or sometimes very muscular uh, legs with very uh, prominent biceps tendons, you're going to need to really get in there and use both hands and squeeze them together to get those vessels to um, co-apt. And this is an example here of without compression. Down here is with compression. We can see here the saphenous vein as it joins into the common femoral vein, very proximal. And this is our common femoral artery without compression. And then we push those, compress those structures down. The veins totally collapse, therefore, there's no blood clot. This is what it looks like with video. We can see the common femoral vein easily compressible. The um, arterial systems stay open. It's just enough compression, uh, pressure to compress the vein. You know when you're pushing too hard if the arteries actually start to, uh, to compress a little bit. And this is what it looks like when you get a clot. Okay, which leg is this? Correct, the right leg, because the vein is here, venous, penis, and this is lateral over here, okay? So when you do identify a clot, that's great. And you want to record it on video and lock that in and then stop compressing, okay? You want to show the people around you on the video, on the machines, they all record video. You want to capture the video and show that loop to the people around you, other students, the attending, whoever, the patient. But if you keep compressing that, you could potentially dislodge it, right? So that's why whenever I see one, I get called in the room and everybody's bouncing on this clock. I'm like, whoa, 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 stop, everybody, stop. Okay, enough. Enough teaching on the patient. Let's go ahead and start treating the patient. Here we are in the pop. Remember that the vein comes to the top in the pop. Here's that popliteal vein up here, popliteal artery. And the vein is easily compressible. There's no clot there. This is what it looks like when there is a clot there. Here's the popliteal artery. We're pushing so hard the artery is actually kind of winking at us there for a second. This is the popliteal vein out here, very dilated with this echogenic thrombus in it. Okay, the vein comes to the top in the pop. Now, you're probably wondering to yourself, how far apart do I space these compressions? Do I go every continuous millimeter so I don't miss that little clot in there? Or is it okay to skip every centimeter? And it turns out that clots usually involve multiple segments or whole venous segments. And so it's adequate to go every one centimeter between your compressions. Okay, so you can go every one centimeter and then compress the vein. And that's okay. 
There's another technique called augmentation. Augmentation is where you put the probe proximally and then you squeeze the calf distally and you see if there's flow between those two sides. Well, you see if there's flow underneath the probe and if you see flow augment underneath the probe in that vein, you assume that there's patency between those two sites. And that's the problem. You're making a pretty big assumption there because there's lots of collateral systems that can conduct that flow and pressures in the um, compartments and stuff that could cause some flow there. So augmentation, while fun to do and occasionally diagnostically helpful, is often misleading and can't be relied upon one way or the other to rule in or out a clot. I like to teach it to medical students because it gets you involved more with Doppler and color, gets you thinking about that, outlines the, vas the uh, vasculature, and you'll see it's kind of fun to do today when you go to practice it, you'll squeeze the calf and you'll see a big blush of flow come back either in the pop or the fem. It's kind of fun to do that. So make sure you do that today. Um, one final word before I conclude is that you may not be aware that um, after hours and on weekends around the country, it's um, in about 85 to 90 percent of hospitals it's actually not possible to get your patient um, a, a study, a, a, a DVT study, um, because there's just there's there's no there's no staffing, there's no ability to do it. And so, what do you do in that situation? You have a patient that you think could have a blood clot in their leg. Um, you can't get the study done, and so what you end up doing is it's after hours at 7 p.m. or it's on the weekends. You end up um, basically waiting, giving the patient blood thinning agent like Lovenox um, or heparin and waiting until the next day when the ultrasound tech comes in to scan the patient. And the problem with that approach is that it keeps a patient all night long in your hospital or your ER unnecessarily, one, and two, the majority of the time these studies are negative, like 90 something percent of the time they're negative. And so you anticoagulate somebody unnecessarily, putting them at risk for the complications of being anticoagulated. And so this is going all over the country still. It's, it's amazing that this is happening still. It's so easy to do, okay? That, that hemodynamic stuff we were talking about earlier, that's, that's pretty high level stuff right there. This DVT stuff, really straightforward. And so this is one more reason why I am so passionate about teaching medical students ultrasound is that when these machines are in your hands, when you're in practice, no matter what field you're into, you will always feel confident about your abilities to rule in or out a DVT. Now, today in the hands-on session, um, I really want you guys to focus on that personal long axis and look at the overall LV function. Watch that anterior septal leaflet, that mitral valve, come up and smack the septum with each um, beat. And I want you to see that interventricular septum and the posterior wall squeeze together. And then I want you to throw some color flow across that mitral valve in the apical four chamber view. I want you guys to measure the, L the left ventricular outflow tract back in the peristernal long. Get that, get that LVOT diameter. Plug that into the calculations package. Switch over to apical five. Drop the Doppler on there. Hit the trace and watch how cardiac output pops up on the screen. I want you all to get that in your hands, march through that during our hands-on. Look at that, that carotid artery to where that intimal medial layer would be on a non-young person. And then finally, get in the groin, get in the pop on your models, do some good compression ultrasound there, and do some augmentation, and watch how easy it is for those vessels to collapse. Any questions? All right, that's it. Thank you.